all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or by going to veteransradio.net where we're on the web 24-7. You can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.net. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at LegalHelpForVeterans.com. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today, retired Army Master Sergeant Daryl Nash. Daryl, thank you for joining us on Veterans Radio today. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Well, a mutual friend put us in contact, and and uh, while we could spend the whole time talking about a uh, master sergeant who served 26 years in the Army, who had deployments over to uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, uh, Afghanistan in 2010 and 2011, um, we're going to really talk about something that you're passionate about, and that is the uh, regiments um, that are known as the Buffalo Soldiers. So uh, tell us how you got involved in kind of being a historian for the uh, Buffalo Soldier Association. Well, it started back in high school. I was very passionate about uh, American history, and I loved it. Uh, we talked about uh, black American accomplishments uh, when I was in high school. The only thing they talked about basically was the Civil War. You know, 186,000 blacks served in the Civil War. It was kind of brief to the point, but, you know, I just love American history. When I joined the Army in uh, June uh, the, uh, uh, the 17th, 1981, as time went on, one of the uh, sergeants told me, he said, Nash, he said, uh, black troops are, has done a lot for this country. And I didn't know all the things we had accomplished. And then I started looking into it. And look, it's, it's like a little puzzle. I started building on it, adding piece by piece of all the things about the uh, about black units serving. You know, uh, a prime example during the uh, Civil War, there was 168 uh, uh, all black units serving in the Civil War. And then after that, how many units served? You know, 137 in World War One. Over 4,000 all black units in World War Two and another 96 black units in Korea and everything. Then finally, you know, integration stuff, but very passionate about it. And uh, when I did that, I took it from there. Uh, uh, when I got out of the military, um, a part breaking that, everything, I continued on doing that research and everything added on to that puzzle about all the black troops. And I ran across Buffalo soldiers, uh, the history they had done, but I started digging more and more into it. I found out, I mean, they did a lot of stuff uh, that is just, you know, mind uh uh, blowing, and I didn't know all that stuff, but um, that's when I started doing it. Uh, one of the guys was um, I started with one unit, and they told me about the ninth and tenth uh, Horse Cavalry Association. They started out in uh, 1967, became friends with those guys, and then I became friends with the uh, 24th Infantry Regiment uh, here in this Tacoma, Washington. And uh, and I asked, I wanted to be the historian, and I took again building building on that puzzle, adding more pieces to it. And the more I started learning, the more people saw how passionate I was. And they said, oh, this guy be a great historian. And that kind of 
took it from there, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> Never looked back since. Well, it's both. A, you have to enjoy it. It has to be a passion. And then you get volunteered for stuff. So that's. A <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yes, sir. That is definitely true. So so let me set this up because we don't teach enough of this history. Uh, and, and here on Veterans Radio, we try to get the history of our American veterans out to more people. It actually was an act of Congress in 1866 that created six all black peacetime regiments, um, then consolidated in, into four, and that's the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th in, Infantry Divisions. That became kind of uh, known as uh, the Buffalo Soldiers. But it's a curious name, uh, Master Sergeant. Where does the name Buffalo Soldiers come from? Well, that's a good one, too. Uh Native Americans gave us that name, particularly with the Cheyennes. There was nothing written in stone or edged in stone of that, but that's the name we got uh, from the Cheyennes. And that's the first time they ever seen black troops of that caliber. Um, and how they got the name, there have been two stories. One said because of the black man's hair uh, reminds them of the buffalo uh, mane, the dark mane around the head of the buffalo. And also, they, it was given to us uh, because Native Americans revered the buffalo so much. And if you know, you study history, uh, every part of the buffalo was used from the horns, the hooves, tongues, everything of that buffalo was used and they revered as part of their main food source. And they, uh, the buffalo, well, they didn't have rifles at that time. They were using bows and arrows. And when they noticed when they engaged the buffalo trying to bring it down, the buffalo just wouldn't stop. It just kept going and going and fighting and putting up a, you know, a, a, a resistance until it finally capitulated. And that uh, was part of the black man's fighting spirit that they respected that. And if you study the Cheyennes, it's quite unique. The Cheyennes respected uh, military proudness and, you know, bravery and courage. They respected that. And there were two things, if you came across the Cheyennes, there are two things they would usually do to you if they captured you. Either they killed you or they made you a prisoner. But if they made you a prisoner, they had been known to treat you so well that you just basically was incorporated into the tribe. You were no longer a prisoner. So that's what they would do and stuff. And also I want to correct, make one small correction. Uh, they weren't regiments, I mean divisions, they were regiments, and I want to clear that up because uh, what happened, the 24th Regiment, there was a 24th Division, there was a 25th Infantry Regiment as well as a 25th Division, they both are totally different, and that's what happened because sometimes people would try to steal the Buffalo Soldiers' history. And uh, we have to, I want to clear that up. So they weren't division, they were regiments. That's why you talk to uh, historians such as yourself to make sure that you get it right. And we, <laughs> we appreciate that. And certainly this was at a time, you know, we're talking around the Civil War and the Indian Wars. This is a time when there was question about whether or not the African-American would fight for the country and how well they would do and whether or not they could be commanded by uh, fellow African-Americans. Talk to us about how that progression worked and how the efforts of the Buffalo Soldiers really convinced a lot of people. Well, what convinced was that what base was after the Civil War. They were impressed with the black troops. They fought in the Civil War. Uh, I think it was about 36, no, 38,000 of them died in the Civil War, mostly from disease, and, and about 5,000 died from, uh, you know, uh, uh, injuries from the war itself. So they were uh, impressed with black troops, their prowess in combat. So, and this was quite unique. July the 28th, 1866, on the 39th Congress, they will, uh, the United States military as a whole was going to get a, was it's going to get a professional army. And that means starting from scratch, because at that time we didn't have a professional army. And the only time they used black troops was for the old saying, break in case of emergency. Well, this time they were going to make black troops a part of the team. Basically, you know, like a law firm, we'll make you a partner. Well, basically they said, okay. And because we dropped off the word colored troops, they were now just going to be in U.S. troops, which is quite unique. And to make sure everybody was inclusive, they brought in black troops, and they also brought in 1,000 Native Americans. Uh, they're going to be scouts to all the American units uh, that was uh, being formed. Uh, we had a total of 10 cavalry. Two of those cavalry units were black, and cavalry was considered elite, the reason why they rode horses. Uh, cav had to do a total of three years in the military. The infantry soldier had to do two years. And uh, the uh, uh, you had a total of 45 uh Cavalry units, four of them were black, the 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st. Like anything in life, the military was too big, so we got to shrink down. They didn't 
uh, giving out the cavalry units, they remained 10, and but they went from 45 infantry down to 25. And what they did, they combined the 38th, 39th, 40, and 41st uh, to make the 24th and 25th infantry regiments. The 38th and the 41st became the 24th infantry regiment, and the 39th and 40th became the 25th infantry regiment, again, keeping black troops. And all of this came about it was a congressional mandate, July the 28th, 1866. So uh, so they knew they could fight and everything else, but they were doing something, not just making history. They wanted to be making history in a very special way because those black troops were so, it was the first time also they would get a retirement check. They were making $13 a month. We laugh at that today because, right. you know, the time and stuff. But, you know, $13 back then was a lot of money, uh, you know, and uh, they also could uh, qualify for a pension. Most of those black folks came from uh, the plantations, and you work from sun up to sundown. There was no plantation, no retirement. But this time we qualified. If they do 30 years, they qualified for a pension, and, you know, and uh, uh, all of the bells and whistles that go with that. Uh, also... Uh, in the process of, of that, like I said, we're making history. Those black troops were so disciplined. Uh, we had uh, the Buffalo soldiers had the lowest desertion rate, the lowest alcoholism rate, the lowest suicide rate. They also had the highest adjustability rate because working on those plantations, they could adapt to tough and ardent condition compared to their white counterparts. And uh, they didn't have any black officers right off the bat. The only correction, the only black officers they had were the chaplains. And they too were making, was going to do something unique, uh, not just for the uh, uh, for the religious side of the house, but it was also for the educational. One of the better known was uh, Colonel Allen Allensworth. Uh, he wrote up an entire education program because he was so concerned. He said, um, when a young man is hitting the books, become educated. He's not out there chasing skirts or the vices of the world. And he was pretty much right on the money. And in the process, when he started that process, little did he know it would still be used today by the United States military, uh, not for the officer side, but just for the enlisted side. When I was in the Army, all of that training we got, it basically can be uh, attributed back to him uh, because he became the father of the education for the United States uh, military because he started that and everything. If you ever get a chance to go to California, they have a park still exists today that's named after him, the Allensworth uh, Park. I ne- I'd never, I never heard that uh, before. That's uh, another great uh, piece of history that gets lost, uh, unless oh, yeah. we're talking mm-hmm. to somebody with your your level of uh, experience and education in this subject. The distinct the, the the Buffalo Soldiers distinguished themselves in many campaigns, and and actually a number of them were awarded uh, the the Medal of Honor, I believe. Yes, uh-huh. uh huh. A total of 23 Medal of Honor recipients they received. They also uh, received a total of 62 uh, certificates of merit, and that's the equivalency to today's uh, Distinguished Service Cross or the Distinguished Flying Cross. Those are the second highest award for valor. So they received about 62 of those. Um, they took part in every uh, war we had except for World War One. Uh, there were no Buffalo soldiers that went overseas. Uh, well, Buffalo soldier units went overseas. There were men who had served with the 9th and 10th, 24th and 25th. They did go over as individuals, but not as a uh, as units. And at that time, during World War I, uh, the uh, 24th and the 10th Cavalry had been assigned with General Pershing uh, to deal with Pancho Vila from 1916 to 1917. And uh, uh, World War and uh, the uh, the ninth and the um, uh, the twenty fifth was in the, the Philippines. No, the ninth they were they were in different. The twenty fifth was in the uh, Hawaii and the ninth cavalry was in uh, the Philippines. And if you notice World War One, the United States never sent their best troops overseas. They kept their best troops. Uh, Woodrow Wilson kept his best troops back in the states. Most of the units went overseas with most of the National Guard. Not trying to knock the National Guard. But you can say in so many words, they want our best troops. So when they went overseas. Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, and you mentioned it earlier, the country has gone through this cycle of we don't want an army. We don't want a professional military. Oh, we need one. Okay, we're going to scale it back down. Oh, boy, we guess we need it again. Now we got to have a draft. Now we got to have volunteer army. We really have kind of... Um, come and gone in different directions on how to protect the security of the country. And the need for the Buffalo Soldiers as distinct um, uh, regiments uh, changed over time, didn't it? 
Uh, yes. Uh, well, as the years went on, because again, the, the nation was uh, becoming more, you know, um, coming to world power, you know, especially after the Spanish American War, after we defeated Spain, I think they were the fourth or fifth largest nation in uh, military in the world. We defeated them and we acquired uh, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Guam, and the Philippines and stuff. And of course, since we did win, you'll know, beat up on little Spain and we gave them $20 million on top of, you know, as a little gift. Uh, but uh, we, uh, uh, from 1899 up to the year 1914, Buffalo soldiers, uh, ninth, all of them at one time had served in the Philippine, uh, Philippine insurrection. Uh, the first surrender, uh, the Buffalo soldier got the, one of the surrenders there was uh, 1899 for one of the uh, Spanish generals that were there. I do have a copy of that in my files. Uh, but they were coming to, you know, uh, we, we have a part, we have a stake in the country with all the things they were doing. We fought in the, uh, uh, like I said, the uh, 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 doing the Mexican expedition and everything. And also to bring up uh, a lot of famous people served with the Buffalo soldiers. Perhaps I mentioned some names. That might yeah, please, please uh, uh, do. Uh, one of them was General uh, John Pershing. He served the 10th Cavalry. He was very impressed with them. And um, he talked highly of them and everything. And uh, when he went to West Point as an instructor, he was kind of appalled when he saw the West Point cadets, where they did drill and ceremony, especially with the horses. They were very, they just when I, they, they didn't do a good job. And General Pershing requested a contingency of the 10th Cavalry to come there to show them the proper drill and ceremony with the horses and everything else. And they would stay there all the way up to 1940 uh, when the 10th Cavalry, uh, we had a, we didn't notice ourselves. We found out we had a contingency had been there up to 1940. And during all that time at Fort Myers and in that area, uh, they were also, right before the old guard came in, they were the guys that would go to to do the ceremonial uh, presentation for dignitaries of the state and everything before the old guard took it over. So they were the guys who did all of that. Another person in 1926 to 1927 was Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was with the 24th Infantry Regiment when it was at Fort Benning uh, during that time frame. He was the uh, 2nd Battalion Commander. Uh, George uh, S. Marshall, the man behind the Marshall Plan, from 1909 to 1911, he's with the 24th Infantry Regiment when it was at Madison Barracks, uh, Sackett Harbor, New York. Uh, a guy by the name of uh, Carl Spatz, uh, later on became one of the Air Force uh, bomber commanders uh, during World War II. He served with Buffalo soldiers on Hawaii, the 25th Infantry Regiment uh, from 1915. It was quite interesting. He said that was the best tour of duty in the Army that one year with the 25th while they were there, uh, the 25th Infantry Regiment, not the division. I want to make sure that's clear because I think the 25th Division tried to steal their honor one time. And uh, some of the, uh, the history that added into their own. Um, also, there's a uh, Colonel Abner Doubleday. Uh, that name always sounds funny sure. because he's responsible for supposedly inventing baseball, and he was assigned to Buffalo Soldiers. He was the uh, second regimental command of the 24th Infantry Regiment, uh, and also um, uh, General uh, Grierson. Uh, he was an outstanding cavalry commander during the Civil War. He carried out two major uh, cavalry raids into the Confederacy. One was, I think, 300 miles long raid into the Confederacy, d disrupting their wagon trains and everything. So he became the 10th Cavalry uh, uh, Commander. And some of those white officers, they showed their love and appreciation of the black troops. Uh, they spent a long time with them. I mean, you know, like Grierson and uh, Colonel Hatch and some of those guys, uh, Lieutenant Bigelow, they spent a lot of time with their black troops or colored troops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting history. And again, as the uh, army ultimately gets integrated uh, that piece of history kind of uh, fades into the uh, into the background um, but but uh, as you look at it uh, we're talking to a master sergeant uh, Daryl Nash retired from the army after 26 years I believe it was um, no, that's true mm -hmm. wh why is it important to keep telling these stories uh, about these uh, heroic men who served as Buffalo soldiers? 
Well, this is American history. This is just, this is not black history. These men were American. This is American history. And they showed, um, uh, basically, I would like to compare it to Esau and Jacob. You know, her brother said, we're not going to sell our birthright. We have, a, we, we have a stake in this wonderful country. We have built it. Um, I mean, like I said, Buffalo Soldier did a lot of things. They were... Uh, uh, they were park rangers. Some of the uh, parks were protected by them, like the sequoias, uh, the Glacier uh, Creek parks and everything. Uh, also in Hawaii, if you ever get a chance to go to Hawaii on the big island, uh, Mauna Loa, uh, that trail was constructed by E Company of the 25th Infantry Regiment, not the 25th Division, uh, in October the 15th, 1915. That trail goes all, all the way up to the volcano, still exists today. Uh, those black troops uh, constructed that trail. If you go down to Sequoia's uh, Colonel, uh, at that time, uh, Captain Young, Charles Young, he constructed that a trail all the way up in the Sequoia's where people can go camping and everything else. So we have a great stake in it, all the things they did. From 1916 to 1915, the 24th Infantry Regiment, not the division, they produced the most boxing champions in U.S. military history. They still hold the record. And the reason why they stopped in 1950, because they were the last of the Buffalo soldiers to go into combat, they went to a place called Korea. Uh, speaking of Korea, the first ground victory, the Battle of Yechon, was won by the 24th Infantry Regiment because at that time, the North Koreans were some tough hombres. They were kicking everybody's butt. And these guys uh, from the 24th Infantry Regiment, 25th Division, they went in and they stopped them, changed the battle on that one, a little bit of a tempo. So uh, they, uh, it was four of them. Now, when they, uh, you know, integration came in uh, for the military, uh, under Harry S. Truman. And speaking of that, we're going to be celebrating the 75th uh, anniversary of the integration of the United States forces uh, in Houston, Texas, uh, uh, this year, July the 23rd through the uh, 30th. And I'll be one of the main speakers on that, uh, the importance of that. Uh, but they have, uh, we have shaped the country and everything else. Uh, uh, that movie called Apocalypse Now uh, with Robert Duvall and talk about, uh, he said it was attached to the 9th Cavalry Division, but it was the 9th Cavalry Regiment, that's what it was. That unit he was with, that aviation unit, uh, they got the they lineage from the 9th Cavalry. They had a very, speaking of of them, they had a very awesome reputation in uh, Vietnam. So the, a lot of units still, uh, there's three of the units still exist today, remnants of it. Uh, the 1st Battalion of the 24th MQ Regiment uh, is up there in Fairbanks. I'll be going up there next month for a presentation. Uh, the 9th and the 10th Cavalry still have remnants uh, out of Colorado and also Texas. So, I, and I think that's important for veteran radio listeners to understand that the, the what started back in the 1860s still ripples forward today, 100 plus years later. And uh, many men uh, not only serve, but kind of associate themselves uh, with service to the to these um, regiments that uh, have claim to the title the, the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, recently was at a ceremony honoring uh, Major General Oliver Dillard, who, um, who served uh, in, in Korea and in Vietnam, and, and his family claims that uh, uh, relationship as well, as, as does uh, still today. There are, there are motorcycle clubs, uh, Buffalo Soldier motorcycle clubs, that kind of keep the camaraderie alive. And, and you probably see this all over the country, I, I suspect, uh, uh, Daryl. Yes, sir, that's true. There's about 1,200 uh, motorcycle clubs uh, across the nation that keeps that uh, history alive. There's also different uh, Buffalo Soldier associations. Um, the one that I'm a part of is the one that's located in Houston, uh, the 9th and 10th Cavalry Horse uh, Cavalry Association. And they started out in 1967 as a big barbecue there at uh, Fort Riley, uh, Kansas. And about 400 guys showed up just reminisced their days of what they did, very pleased with their accomplishments. And next thing you know, they start uh, bringing their families and then they said, well, let's start doing this every year. And that's what they started there in uh, Kansas, uh, Fort Riley. And they continued on and began to metastasize our chapters across the nation, part of our organization. But they're different ones. And what we do is perpetuate uh, the history uh, uh, of the Buffalo Soldier, their accomplishments to this country. And uh, you know, they have nothing to be ashamed of. There is nowhere in recorded history where Buffalo Soldiers committed atrocities in war. None. Um, you know, they did a lot of great things. I mean, I can give a doggone dissertation, all the things they did, you know, with the lowest desertion rate, lowest alcoholism rate, suicide rate, 
uh, you know, highest rate for adjustability to tough conditions, and they wanted to be there. You had a few bad apples like anything, but overall, uh, they did an excellent job of maintaining our uh, order in the Old West, and they protected Native Americans. They did with cattle rustlers, you name it. They were out there doing it. And also, too, uh, speaking of July the 28th, 1866, when they wrote all that stuff up, begin starting a new professional army, it was quite interesting. When I started reading all of that, every unit had to have a band, and every unit had to have a baseball team. <laughs> that was quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, make mention of the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum, which is in Houston, Texas. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, uh, a young man by the name of retired uh, Captain uh, uh, Paul Matthews. He's in, he got that project started and got it off the ground. And right now we're in the process of trying to expand that one as well because it's, they got so much artifacts. People are sending them artifacts and everything. Uh, they're trying to get a bigger place. It still exists today. It's open uh, uh, every day, I think, except for Sunday. Uh, but that's where we're going to have the reunion uh, this year. All this welcome and everything. Uh, but it's a, got a lot of artifacts on Buffalo soldiers, a lot of artifacts. And... Uh, you know, showing the appreciation what uh, Buffalo soldiers have done for the con uh, contribution for uh, the, the country, to the country, and for the military. And again, we want to perpetuate that and uh, uh, keep that history going on and educate uh, the public of what the things they did and the stuff. And believe it or not, right there in Houston, when I was there one time, there was a guy, uh, pretty shameful, and, you know, in my opinion, he had been living in Houston all that time, stayed less than 100 yards away from that museum. He had no idea that it, 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 that it even existed. That was quite interesting. Yeah, 100 that, yards yeah, that's, from that, the museum. That's, Didn't even know it. That's the sort of thing you hear too often about, oh, I, you know, well, open your eyes. It's, there's stuff out there. And, and we want to encourage anybody who maybe is traveling this summer through Houston and, and, uh, or maybe can detour over there, take a look at the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum. You'll be... Uh, educating yourself, but also your young ones, and I think that's part of what we're trying to do here. And I know that oh, Daryl yes. Nash mm -hmm. is trying to do here is make sure that the young ones uh, get some perspective on history and this particular kind of history because they have a lot to be proud of, don't they? Oh yes, sir, absolutely. Oh Lord, and like I said, a lot of things they did. Uh, not only that, too, they played against. Uh, they put players into the Negro leagues. They played against Negro leagues. They played against some historical black colleges and university. All that stuff was documented. They produced um, uh, one of them, the units, the twenty-four, produced the most uh, boxing champions for the entire U.S. military. That include Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, and they still own those records. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Master Sergeant uh, Daryl Nash, for spending a little time with us today and wearing your uh, historian hat on for the Buffalo Soldiers uh, and the regiments, the 9th and 10th Cavalry and 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments, and just kind of mm -hmm. giving us some information that we probably haven't heard before, uh, maybe haven't bumped into, and giving us some resources that we can go look at. Uh, Daryl, thanks uh, for spending time with Veterans Radio today. Well, thank you, sir. The honor is all mine. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to veteransradio.net. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our... National sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, NVBDC.org, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan, VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor, and the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. We appreciate all your support. You can go to veteransradio.net click on the 
sponsor level and continue to support keeping Veterans Radio on the air. And until next time, you are dismissed. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.